The Lord be with you. Well, welcome back to another installment of our Nerds of the Words Bible Study through 2 Peter. Uh, today, we are finally getting ready to finish up all of chapter 1. Uh, so just a reminder of where we have been thus far in his writing. Uh, Peter, the apostle, is reminding um, people who have heard the testimony about Jesus and believed in it that faith is precious. And it doesn't matter if it's the faith of the apostles, those people who had walked with Jesus and eaten with Jesus and shared fellowship with Jesus, or if your faith came further down the line, uh, if you heard about Jesus from someone else and believed, having never met him personally and never known him personally, uh, your faith is still precious. All faith is precious, and it needs to be added to. It needs to be supplemented with some things. Uh, so the apostle works through this list of virtues, uh, adding to your faith things like goodness and knowledge and self-control, uh, adding things like mutual affection or brotherly love. And he concludes with the apex, which is love itself, agape love. Uh, he talks about if you are adding these things to your faith, if you are constantly exercising these things and being a partaker in the divine nature, then you are affirming or making sure your calling and the choosing that God has given to you. And that's kind of the main point of this first thematic section, section A, to make every effort to confirm your calling. Uh, that's what you're supposed to be doing. If you do this, if you add these things to your faith, then you also will have added to you a rich welcome into the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, that is where we have come from. That has essentially gotten us to the end of this first thematic section. Today we are going to get into the second thematic section, B, which is the coming of Jesus in power. So our reading today comes from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 21. For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven, and we were with him on the sacred mountain. We also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable. And you will do well to pay attention to it, as to a light shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will. But prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along, by the Holy Spirit. These are the very words of our Lord and God. So the apostle says, we did not follow cleverly devised stories. Uh, the idea behind that phrase is uh, something that was intentional, something that was cunningly devised. Uh, it wasn't accidental. It's a kind of false wisdom, something that people know is not true, but they still sort of weave that tale together anyway. The word in Greek at the end there is where we get our English word myth from. Uh, and while we can use the term myth or mythology in our language um, to certainly have some truth to it, uh, myth in the Greek New Testament is always used in the negative sense. Uh, so the apostle seems to be saying, we didn't do this. We didn't make these stories up. Uh, they weren't forged. They weren't to deceive you. They aren't fables or fairy tales or things that were just made up. Um, we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power. And in that Greek sentence, um, coming and power are compound. They're right next to each other. So he's actually saying, uh, we told you about the coming and power of, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, that idea seems to be his messianic identity. 
Uh, so the coming certainly gives us the impression of the incarnation. It includes his life, his teaching, uh, the inauguration of his public ministry at his baptism. Uh, it probably includes his death and his burial and his resurrection. All of that is about his messiahship. And the apostle says, this is what we were telling you about uh, because we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And that word eyewitnesses, very, very important to this. Uh, we had talked about in the previous video how kind of the genre or subgenre of this letter is a testimony. Uh, it's a farewell discourse. When someone knows that they are about to die, uh, they purposely take steps to remind their successors about what is most important. Uh, the Apostle Peter has told us in the previous paragraph that he knows his time is drawing to a close, that Jesus himself had told him that this was going to happen. So he wants to take every effort to remind uh, people who have believed in Jesus and who will be left behind what they need to know, what is important. Uh, and while he's doing that, uh, he says, we heard... Uh, Jesus received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Now what's interesting in the synoptic Gospels, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, the voice from heaven speaks on two different occasions. The first time is at Jesus' baptism, where these very things are said, that Jesus is the Son, Jesus is loved by God, and that God takes great pleasure in his Son. Uh, but then the voice from heaven also speaks again at Jesus' transfiguration on the mountainside. Uh, and what's interesting is in two of the three synoptic Gospels, um, this exact phrase is not used. It's only in Matthew's Gospel at the transfiguration that we see all three of these elements, Jesus being the son, Jesus being beloved, uh, and Jesus uh, bringing great pleasure to the father. That only appears in Matthew's gospel. Uh, what we learn as we read just a verse further in this letter of second Peter is that he isn't referring to the baptismal account. He for sure is referring to the transfiguration account, which makes sense. If you think about it, um, the apostles were not present necessarily at Jesus's baptism. We know John the baptizer heard the voice from heaven, maybe some other people who were on the shore, but Jesus doesn't call his disciples till later in the narrative uh, according to this letter, it says, We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain, or holy mountain, as it says in Greek. Uh, we shouldn't be surprised that he currently is talking about the Mount of Transfiguration, because as we had pointed out last time, uh, there's all these allusions that already started in the paragraph before uh, Peter refers to his body as the tent of this body. Um, and that word tent is what he used when he saw Jesus and Moses and Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, he said, hey, we should put up tents so that each one of you could stay and we could uh, extend this experience for a while. Uh, also, when Peter said, and I will make every effort to see that after my departure, you will always be able to remember these things. Uh, that word for departure is the word in Greek, exodus, which is exactly what Luke's gospel tells us is what Moses and Elijah were talking with Jesus about on the Mount of Transfiguration, uh, his upcoming exodus at Jerusalem. So you've got all of this rich imagery, all of this call back to the Mount of Transfiguration, which in and of itself is a very important event. If you think about it, uh, only Peter, James, and John saw this. Uh, this was before Jesus was resurrected. They were able to see Jesus transfigured, transformed before them. His clothes changed. His face changed. They saw him in his glory even before his death. And resurrection. So as you can imagine, that is a life-changing event and an event that carries a lot of weight with it as they share their first-hand testimony with other people. What's interesting, though, is that Peter 
acknowledges the importance of his testimony and his ability to see these things firsthand, but then he shifts what is mostly important as he moves into the next paragraph. Uh, he says, we also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable. Uh, that actually says the prophetic word. It's logos in the Greek. Uh, and you think about that, um, of course, the prophets spoke words. Uh, they gave their messages orally to people who were present. Uh, according to the New Testament, the latter prophets were writing prophets. They actually intended that their messages not just be spoken out loud, but also written down and circulated and shared. Um, if you think about God's word in general, the prophets spoke uh, from the earliest days. Words of prophecy were given uh, from the earliest days, and God's word itself, as it gets recorded and preserved for us, becomes its own fixed word of prophecy. Uh, Peter says this is something completely reliable, and that phrase in the Greek, uh, it carries this connotation of something that is sure, uh, something that is fixed or rather permanent, um, but it's also in the comparative sense, which is why some English translations might say something like, um, we have the prophetic word as something even more sure or even more reliable. Uh, it seems to be being compared with what came before it, and that is the eyewitness testimony of the apostles. Uh, so Peter seems to be saying, yeah, your faith is sure and you can have confidence in it because you heard it from us. We didn't make this stuff up. We were actually physically there. We saw these things. We're telling you firsthand testimony of what we saw. But you can have even more confidence because you know that it aligns itself and it becomes in and of itself scripture, this sure prophetic word which has been around since the dawn of writing since the beginning of uh, God's people. And that is something that gives us um, faith and points us uh, to hope and gives us a sure path. He says, you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Uh, as the psalmist said, God's word is like a lamp unto my feet, a light to my path. It uh, chases away the darkness. It shows us the true way. It reveals to us truth. So this would make sense if the apostle knows that his time is drawing to a close. Uh, apostles had died prior to Peter. If he knows that he is about ready to die for the faith because Jesus had revealed it to him. Obviously, the other eyewitness apostles are going to die off as well. So the question is, where is the source of authority going to be? If it's no longer with those people who personally knew and saw and learned from Jesus, uh, how can you know that you have assurance of the truth? And he seems to intentionally be shifting it to the word that these written words, both of what they would call the First Testament, what we would call the First Testament, uh, as well as what is becoming the New Testament, um, these are sure, these are going to be the sources of authority moving forward because the eyewitnesses aren't going to be around forever. Then he moves in, in these last two verses, to why you can depend upon this prophetic word. Uh, he says, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. Uh, our English word for interpretation comes from the Greek idea of loosing or liberating something. In other words, uh, the prophets weren't there to sort of uncover, unearth, shed their own opinion on what is locked away in these texts. Um, no, it wasn't their interpretation that was important. Uh, instead, prophecy never had its origin in the human will. But prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So in other words, this has very little to do with human agency and everything to do with the divine spirit. That's how you know that you can trust the word because it comes from God, 
not from humanity or from human interpretation or cleverly devised myths that have been used to deceive or to present false wisdom to people. So the apostle seems to be setting up by the end of this chapter a contrast between those who saw Jesus, those who follow the words of the apostles who saw Jesus, uh, those who are following in the steps of the prophetic word, and then those who are intentionally being cunning or deceptive or inventing other stories. Now, if you combine that with everything that has come before it in this chapter, Essentially, you've got the recipients of this letter having a faith like the apostles because they are following the word of the apostles. You've got the fact that they need to keep growing in their faith and in their knowledge and that they can have assurance of the inscripturated word that it is reliable. And that all other forms of knowledge uh, out there are only man-made and for that reason they are unreliable. And that actually sets us up for our next thematic section, which is going to all be about false teachers. So that is enough for us to think about right now. Uh, go ahead and chew on that in the days ahead uh, and prepare yourselves, open yourselves for what's going to come next with these false prophecies and teachers that the apostle is going to talk about. But until we get there in these days of ongoing pandemic, May the peace of God be with you.